Edison Open House Global Healthcare 2022. In this session, we're highlighting the work of Cardia, an Australian oncology biotech focused on solid tumours. To tell me more is CEO James Garner. Hello, James. Hello, Vivian. Great to be with you again. So first of all, tell me a bit more about the business model of Cardia, which is an unusual one. As Casia doesn't invent drugs, we, we look for drugs that really excite us, but which exist in other companies and which aren't strategic for those companies. They don't fit with the business of the company that they're currently in. We look to bring them into Casia, we take them through clinical trials, and we bring them forward to patients. And the two drugs in our pipeline reflect that strategy. One of them was originally invented by Genentech, a US company. And the second one uh, by Sanofi, and then developed uh, through its initial development by Evotech, a, a European company. So, um, so we're, we're living this business model, and it's something that really sets us apart from most of the biotech companies out there and why wouldn't genentech do it itself i mean it's 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 you know it's right out there it's not a small company well, most big pharma companies produce more medicines than they have the capacity to take forward. And, uh, and so they make decisions like every company. And, uh, and as much as anything, this is driven by strategy as by capacity. Uh, many companies decide they want to focus on particular kinds of cancer, particular treatment strategies. Um, for example, Sanofi has, has put a lot of effort into becoming a biologics company over the last decade or so. But that's left smaller molecule drugs like EVTA to one less core for their business. So we really, uh, we really focus on these, on these opportunities where they just don't fit with the strategy of the company, and, uh, but are nevertheless very promising drugs on a standalone basis. So you're rummaging through their cupboards, uh, you're finding these uh, drugs with a lot of potential, and what kind of indications are you thinking about? Well, broadly speaking, Casio is focused on solid tumours. Um, that, that's, uh, that's been most of our, our work up till now. Paxalisib, our lead program, is being developed for a disease called glioblastoma, which is the most common and the most aggressive form of brain cancer. But it does have potential uses in a whole range of other brain cancers, and we are investigating those. We have a, a whole program of clinical trials going on to look at other opportunities to expand Paxalisib beyond glioblastoma. Um, but right now we see it primarily as a brain cancer drug. evt one has a whole range of potential applications ranging from relatively uncommon tumours like sarcoma right up to very common cancers like lung cancer. And, and we're still a little bit early in the development there, so we're, we're, we're reserving judgment on exactly where we're going to focus for, for another year or two. Um, but there's a lot of possible places to take that drug, which makes it also a really exciting opportunity. So let's look at Paxalisib uh, first. So the key point uh, about it is that it crosses the brain blood barriers, which is, is a big issue in obviously treating brain cancers. So where have you got on that one and what's the plan for the year ahead? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, I mean, getting drugs into the brain is the biggest challenge in, in brain cancer and, and one that uh, it's a hurdle that has, that has felled many, if not most, of the drugs that have tried. We've, been, we've, we've come a, a lot further with Paxalis than most drugs have ever got. We are now in a pivotal study for registration. It's a trial called GBN Agile. It's been open for the better part of a year in the United States and recently in Canada. Uh, and we plan to take it to Europe in China in 2022. So we're really in the end game with this drug. We are in a pivotal study. Uh, we're potentially within a couple of years of the commercialization event if everything goes according to plan. And so, uh, so we, we've really come most of the distance already with this drug and, and now uh, really all eyes are on the pivotal study to, to see uh, where, uh, where this takes us. And glioblastoma is a real heart sink cancer with, I think, less than a 5% chance of, less, much less 5% 5, 5 chance of making it to five years after diagnosis. So what's the size of this uh, very much unmet need uh, market here? Yes, this is a, about as bad as cancers get, really. The, the prognosis is unfortunately terrible and really has improved in the, the last 20 years or more. There's about 133,000 patients a year diagnosed with glioblastoma, roughly 10% of that in the United States, about 20-something thousand in Europe, and, and then commensurate um, numbers of patients in, in the rest of the world. 
so um, so it's a, it's a it's a meaningful number of patients. This is not a rare cancer. It's not as common as prostate cancer, or lung cancer, or breast cancer, but it's by no means a rare disease. Conservatively, most um, most authorities estimate the size of the market as around about one and a half billion dollars a year. And that's corroborating is that the one drug that's, uh, that, that's approved here by the FDA was about a billion dollar a year product before it lost patent protection. So everything points to a market size in, in that ballpark. And relatively uncontested for newly diagnosed patients, there is one FDA approved drug treatment right now, and it doesn't work for two thirds of the patients. So this is the definition of unmet medical need. And uh, as I say, not a not a small market by any means. And it would be very exciting if, as you indicate, you could take it into other brain cancers other than glioblastoma. Absolutely. There's there's a whole host of possibility. One of the areas we're looking at is a is a rare childhood brain cancer called DIPG, which is thankfully is a rare cancer, but but a, a horrendous disease, no FDA approved drug treatment. We're also looking at brain metastases, that is cancer that spread to the brain from elsewhere in the body. And we've recently started a study in a disease called primary CNS lymphoma. It's actually a, a blood cancer lymphoma, but it occurs in the brain. It's a particular subtype of it. And the kind of drug that Paxalicid is has shown great promise in lymphoma outside of the brain. So we're really excited to see how our drug works in the brain. I think it's a very promising study. So we've got a lot of ions in the fire with this drug. So let's move on to EVT801, which is uh, a recently acquired uh, drug. Tell me where you are with that and what the main indications are. Well, we've started a phase one human trial with this drug. Uh, we, uh, we brought the drug into the company in uh, April 2021. We started the phase one study in November 2021. So really very quick work. And in all that time, we developed the protocol. We've, uh, we've been through the whole regulatory process. We've opened the study to recruitment in France. It's, it's now well underway, so far so good, but of course still early days for, for this phase one study. Uh, so, um, so things are going great. We're really pleased with, with progress and we're really excited about the study we've put together. It's a very, very sophisticated piece of, of science. In terms of where EVT801 goes, I think it's still a very open field right now. The study that we, we've started is in a broad population of advanced cancer patients. That's common for new cancer drugs. We will narrow that down, but uh, whether we, we go for, for a disease like kidney cancer, which has been a very well proven uh, disease area for this class of drugs, or whether we go for something a little bit newer like lung cancer or endometrial cancer, for example, but those decisions will, will be made in the future. But there the really, uh, the really is a lot of possibility here. So it's gonna be a lot of fun to, to sit down with the clinicians and work out how we think creatively about how to position this new drug. So are we, you're going for solid tumours there, but is there a particular, you know, genetic signature to uh, the tumours that you're targeting? What's the, the mechanism uh, here? Yeah, so the drug works by inhibiting a target called VEGFR3. Oh, that's um, the one that, so VEGF is the bit that, that uh, you know, creates the blood supply, essentially, that keeps exactly. you Exactly. Exactly, that's right. Um, vascular endothelial growth factor, one of these fantastic names that, that we love in drug development. Um, and, and this is well proven territory because there's, there's a number of drugs that target this whole mechanism. The leader in, the, in this space is a drug called Avastin, it's an Hutchinentech drug actually. 15 year old drug still sells about seven and a half billion dollars a year in, uh, in business. So very, very successful way of targeting cancer. The, the distinguishing feature with our drug is that it actually targets a, a, a slightly different uh, part of this VEGF axis. And we're targeting the part of it that's concerned not with the development of blood vessels so much as the development of lymphatic vessels. We all have two circulations in our body, the blood circulation and the lymphatic circulation. Tumors need both to grow and they particularly need the lymphatic circulation to spread, to metastasize as we call it. So cutting off the lymphatic supply to the tumor has many of the same benefits as cutting off the blood supply, 
but actually perhaps has some advantages as well. And so our drug selectively does that. It's really the first drug to work in that way. And, uh, and we think that's going to be very, very interesting to see how this compares to some of the existing older drugs in the class. So a really exciting year ahead in 2022 for Casia. But what are the milestones that investors should be focused on in this next year? Well, look, I, th I think there's always uh, three things that I try to highlight. The first is we, we try to very, be very transparent about the operational progress we're making in all this work. Um, just as, as the company moves forward in time, these things become more tangible, more imminent, more real. And so we, we like to share as we're, as we're advancing through the, the trials, as we're starting and finishing trials. So we just the, the operational flow of the work is, is something that I I think can be very important for um, for investors. The second thing, of course, is data. We have right now eleven clinical trials uh, in some stage of activity across our two pipeline assets. And uh, whenever you've got that many trials, there is always a lot to talk about in terms of clinical trial data. And as soon as that becomes available to us, we share it with the, the market, we go through it very carefully. And uh, really any one of these trial results could, could be transformative for Casio. And then the third thing, I always try to highlight is, is what I call the X factor events. The, um, uh, there's a lot of work that goes on in Casio, which is a little bit more exploratory, a little bit more speculative, a little bit more contingent, um, but can be equally transformative. New licensing opportunities, regulatory events, things of that sort. Um, for example, we, we had three licensing transactions in 2021. For obvious reasons, none of them were things we could really indicate in advance to, to investors, but each of them in their way really transformed the prospects of the company. Those sort of things can happen at any time and can really, uh, really change the course of the company. So, um, so there's going to be a lot going on. And uh, as you say, I think it's going to be a tremendously exciting 2022 for us. And uh, we're looking to looking forward to, to sharing that journey as it as it comes. James Garner, it's always such a pleasure talking to you and hearing about the work of Casio. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vivian. It's great to talk.